you are here and looking forward uh, to continuing um, our, our study, the life of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to get into some, some wonderful things, the end of chapter 21 and chapter 22 of the book of Acts, uh, speak about some really interesting aspects of, uh, of what's going on in, in Paul's life during this season. And uh, again, I'm thankful that you're here. Go ahead and if you would, um, uh, get your hymn books ready. We're going to sing glory to his name. But uh, first, let's ask for the Lord's blessing on these services. Uh, would you join with me in a time of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can speak to you tonight and we can ask for your help. And Lord, we do uh, need your help. Uh, we're thankful uh, for what you teach us in your word. We're thankful for uh, every uh, avenue, uh, both civic, family life that you, that you give us. Uh, Lord, we, we're especially thankful for our opportunity to serve you. Uh, Lord, amongst your people and amongst the, the world of those that do not know you, I pray you continue to give us opportunity to be faithful witnesses for you. Uh, we thank you now for this time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So tonight we're going to sing glory to his name. We'll have some favorites and uh, looking forward to singing together uh, some of our favorite songs together. Be ready with those. If you would come now, uh, Brother Kassam, number 586. And let's stand as we sing together. Number 586. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of God. So last week we had Bethany here, and I was trying to like appeal to you guys to say to say like, oh hey, don't pick songs that Bethany doesn't know. You guys gotta be nice. And but uh, no, the thing is, is she there wasn't a she didn't have a problem at all. She played all the songs, but they stumped me a couple of times. Uh, so, anyways, as we uh, as we always do for our favorite time, if there if we have songs coming online, if we have songs coming online, uh, you guys get priority. So go ahead and uh, type a. a, a uh, hymn that you want out there, or a number, and if you have it, and we'll uh, and we'll we'll go to you first if if you're out there. Um, right now, I'm going to go all the way to the back row to Miss Bonnie. Um, page 29. The love of God. Page 29. Beautiful song. We'll sing the first and the last. The love of God. The love of God is greater far than time. 
tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He's reconciled and pardoned from his sin. On the last, could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I tell you, I don't like it as much without the chorus. This, this, but this, this song doesn't have the chorus in it. Uh, yes, ma'am. 28? So right next door, this is my father's world. We'll sing the first and the last. This is my father's world. This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied earth and heaven be one. We have someone online. 553. Do you know this one, Pastor? Okay, you'll have to sing it out for me because I'm not sure if I know it. You guys know this one, sing it out nice and loud. Ah. Uh... 
choice. A good song. Uh, yes. 427. 427. Sweet by and by. So the first and the last. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessing that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore you guys are picking good ones tonight yes Jean. You said five two seven. <clears throat> Another beautiful one. We'll sing a few verses of this song. I love this song. Throw out the lifeline across the dark way. There is a brother whom someone should say. Somebody's brother, oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. and strong why do you tarry why linger so long see he is sinking oh hasten today and out with the lifeboat away then away throw out the lifeline throw out the lifeline Someone is sinking to the way. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Let's sing that last together. Soon will the season of rescue be o'er. Soon will they drift to eternity shore haste then my brother no time for delay but throw out the lifeline and save them today throw out the lifeline throw out the lifeline someone is drifting away for probably one more. Yes, ma'am. Beautiful song. 
saying the first and the last, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Uh, if the usher prepare to receive the offering, we'll sing one more together. It's number 617 in your hymnal, so you don't have to flip all that far. Great and mighty. Beautiful song. There's only two verses, so we will sing them both. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift the banner, let the anthem ring. Praise is to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. We kind of messed that up. We'll let's see if we can do it better on the second verse. It's a little different than you guys are probably used to. Let's sing that second together. Sing to Jesus the song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. Sing to Jesus with a song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. Fill the heavens with a mighty voice. Bless his name, let us all rejoice. Sing to Jesus with the song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. You want to do it again? Yeah, let's, let's sing that first one together again. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift His banner, let the anthem ring. Praise is to our mighty King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Very good. And uh, go ahead and uh, take your Bible, and if you would, open to the book of Acts. We'll start out with a little bit of uh, review uh, before we jump in. We're going to be in Acts chapter 21 uh, tonight, Acts chapter 21, and we'll um, hopefully get through to Acts chapter 22 as well, as we're taking a, some time to go through uh, what, what some would consider the, the kind of the last uh, season or stage of the Apostle Paul's life that we have a lot of details on. There was um, a final stage of, of Paul's life. Uh, that we really don't get a lot of details on, and that's his time um, in Rome. Um, but he gets sent to Rome here from Jerusalem. And, um, you know, spoiler alert, I guess, for, the, uh, for you that um, they said, right, the, the prophet uh, came and, and he said, hey, if you go, if you go to Jerusalem, uh, they're going to they're gonna end up killing you. And uh, that is what ends up happening. And the prophecy was correct. Um, however, he doesn't get killed in, in Jerusalem. Uh, that's where uh, the accusations are made. That's where the imprisonment happens. And, of course, he'll be sent uh, to Rome after that. Just uh, to catch you up, 
Um, uh, Paul was uh, traveling through his last missionary journey uh, and was headed uh, back to Jerusalem. Thank you, Frank. Just needed a, uh, a little water here. And I, I take it as an all-natural um, supplement that keeps my allergies away. And um, this morning, our, um, our kind of living area there around the kitchen and all is, 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 in, a, is in an uproar. And so I did not get a chance to even look over at anything. So I, I forgot to take... I have like a little bit of a raspy throat. I'm thinking it's because I didn't take my uh, allergy thing. So, uh, salute. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that'll clear things up. I had Frank give me a double dose just in case I take one a little bit later as well. But uh, to, ca- to catch you up, Paul said no. He believed it was God's will for him to go uh, to Jerusalem. And so he said, even though it might mean my life, I want to do uh, what is right, I want to do God's will. Sure enough, he gets to Jerusalem, and the folks, even in the church that he's dealing with, they don't really understand the ministry that God has given him or or exactly what's happening with the gospel. Um, They knew this. Uh, They knew that God desired uh, to provide a sacrifice uh, for sin. And uh, and that that was clear. They knew that, and and the, the believing Jews... Right? They knew that Jesus was that Messiah, was that sacrifice. They knew all that. But what did it take for someone uh, to receive the grace of God? What did that take? Did it take being a certain, have a certain heritage? Did it take being of a certain religion? That was the question. And Paul preached salvation by faith, right? By the grace of God through faith. That's how we get saved. And it doesn't matter what your, what your heritage is. It doesn't matter what, what you did believe. A matter of fact, a... a a Jewish person gets saved by trusting God the same way that uh, a heathen person, a Gentile, if you will, get saved simply by placing their faith and trust in God. And so uh, there was a, that, right, praise the Lord for it. And there was, there was a misunderstanding and people thought that, that Paul had somehow become kind of like unclean and he wouldn't have a hearing with any of the, of the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem. And so they send him uh, to do like what I would say is a, um, a ceremonial cleansing uh, um, ritual. And they send him to do this. They say, look, if you can complete this, then on the other side of it, you'll be accepted as clean. You'll be able to have a hearing both with the Gentile Christians, right, that, like us, or by the Jewish Christians at that time. You'll, you'll have a hearing with everybody. And so Paul concedes to this, and it ends up being something that causes a great, a great uproar there in Jerusalem. So if you're, if you're following along, Acts chapter 21, verse number 27. Acts chapter 21, verse number 27. And we'll read... Now, all the way to verse number 36. It says, And when the seven days were almost ended, all right, so he's just about done with this ceremony ritual, the Jews, which were of Asia, uh, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So it's this great commotion, right? And they, and they capture him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and, and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. They, that was the accusation. That was, was wrong, but that was the accusation made. For they had seen before with him in the city uh, Tromphus and, and Ephesian, uh, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They had made some, uh, some assumptions uh, that were not true. And, uh, and all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, uh, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band uh, that all Jerusalem was in uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down. They didn't walk. They ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain, the soldiers, they left. What were they doing to Paul? They were beating him. They were about to kill him. And the, and the Roman centurion guard comes in and they left off beating Paul. So they, they, they stopped what they were doing. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. In some ways, he's going from the frying pan to the fryer. And demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when... He could not know the certainty of the tumult. He commanded him to be carried into the castle. When he had come up the stairs, so it was, as he was born of the soldiers, for the violence of the people, literally had to be carried above the crowd uh, to be 
to be carried away. Otherwise, there was no way they were going to get him in. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. This is uh, the, I would say, the great commotion that, that's happening here. There was a prophecy uh, that if Paul went to Jerusalem that he would die. And I have to suppose that as he's receiving the beating of the crowd, as the, as the mob is, is kind of gathering around him, that it's going through his mind, this is the moment. This is the time, just like the prophet had said, uh, I came to Jerusalem, I knew this was coming, and, and here it is. But in, in his own heart and mind, you, you have to know, because we'll see here as we begin in verse number 37, he had one purpose. He had one goal in heading to Jerusalem, and, and he was going through the ritual ceremony. He was doing these things. Why? Because he wanted to preach the gospel, the clear gospel to, uh, to anyone that would hear. And think about this. In Jerusalem at this time, it's estimated, Josephus estimates, at least two million people were in Jerusalem at this time. That was a, it was a celebration. It was the time of Pentecost. It was the, it was the season when they would all come in and, and uh, observe uh, things there in Jerusalem and The world goes haywire sometimes. Can anyone kind of kind of see that that happens, right? And I, I actually was uh, thinking about trying to just think about all that is going on in our world today. Sometimes it's even hard to wrap your mind around all that's happening. But may I say this? And this point number one here in all of this: the, the riot at Jerusalem, right? The world does not pause and wait for us to catch up. Do you understand? It's not. You can't hit pause. I was playing a, a video game with Grayson the other day and Jackson, and we were playing that video game on that old Atari. And, and you know what happens when they got a little overwhelmed in a certain situation? Jackson did it every time. He paused the game. Life does not pause. You can't say, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Let me, just, let me just hit pause on this. Let me kind of catch up. Let me figure out what's going on. Uh, Paul's in the middle of a fight for his life here. And then the world does not stop. And he doesn't know what's coming next. And he's literally been carried over the mob uh, to the gates of the castle. It just, you know, this is the fortress built by Herod. And Herod was quite the engineer, okay? He built this fortress to honor Mark Anthony. That's the time frame we're talking about. It was surrounded by a 165-foot wide ditch or moat, as they're called, Okay? And they're taking him across. Uh, they're going up the stairs, right, over the moat. And he has a little bit of an amphitheater kind of context. The crowd is running after him. Look what happens in verse 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? So he's, he's addressing... Uh, Lysias, by the way, that's this gentleman's name, and he talks to him in Greek. He gets his attention. Uh, this was uh, because of the education he had received. He was able to speak uh, this man's language, right? And so he speaks to him. He says, can I say something? And of course, that immediately tipped him off because the, the cry of the mob was that this Egyptian had gotten his way into the temple. He says, art thou that Egyptian which... Before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men uh, that were murderers. But Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, city, city of Sicilia, a citizen of, of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So he makes his case, his first case, his first request, um, his first defense even, anything, is to this captain, the chief captain. And what is it that he's asking permission to do? He said, I want to talk to the people. I could, I mean, he had just gotten beat by these people. I'm sure he was bruised and bloodied. The scriptures, he's almost, they were almost going to kill him right before the death blow was coming, on the edge of death. And Paul says, I came here with something on my heart. And I, 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 if it's the death of me, I want to ask permission to go ahead and do it. He wants to preach the gospel. And when he had given him license... Whose decision was it for Paul to be able to speak that day? It was this the authority of this Roman uh, centurion that had, had taken him and, and, he, and he sets the record straight to some extent. He says, I'm not this Egyptian, this murderer that, that you think that I am. It was a case of mistaken identity, right? And Paul stood on the stairs 
And he beckoned with his hand unto the people. And there was made a great silence. He spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. And, and it is actually believed that one of the reasons they gave their attention to him was because he began preaching in Hebrew. He goes from speaking, I guess, Aramaic would probably have been uh, what was spoken. He speaks to the centurion in Greek. He beckons with his hands and he starts talking in Hebrew. Three different languages. I don't know about you, but I have trouble with English, right? Just the one language. It's amazing what's going on here when it comes to his language. And Paul begins to give his personal testimony of salvation to these Jewish people. Look what he says in chapter 22, verse number 1. Men, brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. When they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. So first they quiet down, and now they realize that he's not just speaking Hebrew, he's, he's talking to us. He, he's addressing us. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Sicilia, yet brought up in the city of the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day. He actually gives them courteous, courteously speaks to them, addresses them courteously. Then he's careful to choose his words. He actually compliments them on being zealous for God, right? And I persecuted this way. Now, by the way, he doesn't mention the, the, the term Christian. Remember the, the, the folks following the teachings of Christ, believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They were called Christians first in Antioch. That was a, a moniker that Paul had taken, and uh, they kind of ran with it. It was derogatory, but hey, they, they took that on. But when he's speaking to this crowd, he says, and he calls them this way. And that was one of the... One of the uh, uh, terms that, that people used to refer to Christians. They were either Christians or they were followers of the way, right? And he persecuted this way under the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear me witness, all the estate of the elders, from whom I also I received letters under the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. He says, I was not a believer. There was a time before I had trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you ever have opportunity to give your personal testimony, you should speak about the time before you came to know the Lord. Now, there's very uh, specific things that Paul is mentioning here about this, but he, he's saying, I didn't believe what was right, and actually I was against those that did believe what was right. Whether or not your specific testimony or your story would, would be exactly like the Apostle Paul's, I can, I can tell you this, there was a time for all of us before we believed on the Lord Jesus. It's time for all of us before uh, we believe what was right about our sinfulness and God's forgiveness and the mercy that he had on us. There's a time before that, and that needs to be described. That needs to be known. That's part of all of our stories. There's basically four parts to any, any, any story or testimony of salvation. Before you came to know, know the Lord, how, right? How it happened, when you called upon the Lord, and what the Lord Jesus Christ means to you now that you are saved. He speaks these things. He gives them the details. Verse 6, it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus, about noon suddenly there was shown from heaven a great light round about me. What is he, what is he describing now of when he met Jesus? And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, heard not the voice, right, that spake to me. They, they heard a sound, but they, they didn't know he was speaking directly to, to Saul. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? It's interesting to compare this account with the, the account of it actually happening back in Acts chapter 9. When I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus and 
when Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, that's the Lord Jesus, and should us hear the voice of his mouth. That was the time uh, that, the, of the apostleship, if you will, of the apostle Paul. The, the three years that he spent with the Lord Jesus Christ. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, <laughs> wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beaten every synagogue, then that believed on thee. When the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. He's confessing there to having been in charge of that execution, that martyrdom of Stephen. Very interesting, this 21st verse. There is a word that he mentions. When he mentions this word, it changes everything. Very, very interesting. Take a look. He said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. As soon as he says that word, Gentiles, look at verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then lift up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. As they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. Man, what a commotion. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bathed that she be examined by scourging. By the way, being examined by scourging, do you know what that means? That means we're going to get a confession. <laughs> and we're going to beat you until you confess. That's what uh, examination by scourging means. Is it lawful for you to scourge? Look at the question. As, uh, and as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? There was, very similar to our laws, they call it habeas corpus, right? I mean, literally means show me the body, all right? But it means that you have to get in front of a judge before you can be arrested. You, you will have your time in court. You can't just indefinitely uh, be detained without actually having charges brought up against you formally and, and a right for you to defend yourself in court. Uh, thank God. That is the, the, the terminology or the cliche we, we use. We say innocent until proven guilty, right? That's, that's the law of the land. And what we see happening here in, 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 uh, to Paul in Acts chapter 22 um, is actually the inclination of, of most folks. And thank God that uh, the United States of America has put the, the cruel mob intentions aside and said, no, we're going to live under what? Under the rule of law. Because the rule of law says you can't just make an accusation. They had Paul confused for some Egyptian. They had Paul confused uh, for something he had not done. They, they wanted to kill him uh, for an offense that was not... Um, a capital punishment offense, right? All of these things built into a tumult. And had they had their way that day, had he not called on the civic power of being a Roman citizen, Paul, Paul would have been killed that day. But he proclaims, if you will, kind of habeas, courses, habeas corpus, innocent until proven guilty. I've not been condemned. I'm a, I'm a Roman citizen. And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. In other words, he paid for it. Paul said, But I was freeborn. He wanted to know how he became a citizen, right? Straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. <laughs> those, are, those are the guys, right? Those are the torture, those that should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman uh, because he had bound him. Now he's worried about all these things. We'll get into a little bit more in chapter 22, but let's, let's take some time to kind of unpack and examine a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, Paul is getting falsely accused 
And he takes that opportunity in that moment and the, the natural amphitheater that was, that was created, going up the steps to preach the gospel. There's a lot of different ways to gather a crowd, if you will, right? I think if you would ask Paul, hey, how is it you want to gather this crowd? I don't think getting beaten half to death or maybe even more, maybe three quarters to death, right? Being, being carried away to be tortured, and that's where they were headed. I don't think that would have necessarily been something that, that Paul would have planned. I, I don't know what Paul's plans were after the ceremonial cleansing ritual. I don't know exactly how he thought he was going to go about it. Probably enter into the synagogue, right? And in, in his nice um, Saturday clothes, right? His, his, his Sabbath clothes, right? Uh, opened up the scroll and, and his mind probably had uh, the, the scenario going a little bit different. He wasn't bloodied. He wasn't on the stairs on the way to the prison uh, to, to meet with the torturers. Uh, none of this. But this was the opportunity that God gave him. And may, may I say this? He used the opportunity that God gave him. May I ask you a question? Do you use the opportunity that God gives you? Paul used the opportunity in the, in the worst of times. And then Paul uh, claims uh, for his civic rights. See, Paul invoked his civic rights. He was about to be scourged. And he says, no, no, no. I have a, I have, I have a civic right about these things. And I recently, I was, I got, yeah, Friday night, had a conversation with another pastor, and he said, he said he got into a Twitter battle. Anyone ever got into a Twitter battle, you know? What, are the, what, are the, what exactly are the weapons in a Twitter battle? Wit, intellect, um, what is it called when you just call people names? What is that one called? <laughs> this, this pastor had said that he's in a Twitter battle, and he said, he said regardless of what the truth is, this pastor, other pastor was going on, and uh, mocking people that were trying to work hard to preserve the freedoms of our country. Oh, we just need to just preach the gospel and let God handle all that. And um, here's the thing. That's, yes, we should be preaching the gospel, but for us to say, hey, oh, don't worry about being a good father. Don't work on your marriage. Don't, no, just forget about uh, the, the church or any institution. Just, just preach the gospel. Set all those things aside. No, uh, civic involvement is exactly the same as family involvement and church involvement and being involved in, in business. We, we, yes, we live in this world. We're not of this world. And we use everything for God's honor and God's glory. Paul used the abuse of his citizenship to preach the gospel. But Paul also took a hard stand uh, for the rights that he should have been receiving as a citizen. And, he's in, and we're going to see he's going to take advantage of that to preach the gospel. The problem is, and the problem, probably the misunderstanding that this pastor was fighting about, is people think it's either or. And it's not either or. It's, it's if you have some kind of right to stand on, some kind of freedom to fight for, so that you can preach the gospel, you do it. And if your, your, your rights and privileges are being trampled on and you're being abused, uh, but that gives you an opportunity to preach the gospel, you do it. It's always about preaching the gospel, but it's not one way or the other. Look, if we continue to have freedoms here in, the, in this country, here in the United States, you know what we should use our freedoms for? To preach the gospel. You know what the sad fact is? Most American Christians use their freedoms to build their own castle, to build their own comfort. To, and, and perhaps you've heard this, uh, have the American dream, right? What's, what's the American dream? Uh, a preacher once told me that, that the, the Great Commission and the American dream went head to head here in the United States of America, and the American dream won. Because most Christians have been lulled to sleep by the comforts that the freedoms and the wealth of this country have brought us. And instead of having used, now praise God, there are many Christians that use, yes, their freedoms and the capabilities we have as American citizens to, for the furtherance and for the sake of the furtherance of the gospel. But many, and by the most part, the majority of American Christians do not use their freedom for the sake of the cause of Christ. I believe the statistic, probably even worse. But the last time I checked, about 15 years ago, when Barna had done the study, of how many believers actually share their faith? I think he's, uh, Barna's getting set up to do another uh, study on it. How many believers actually share their faith? And the statistics are 10% or less. How shameful. The lesson we learn here from Paul's life is not, <laughs> is not 
watch out for being abused from your citizenship or don't stand up for your rights or maybe do stand up for your rights. It's whether you are standing up for your rights or your rights are being trampled on. It all should be nothing more than a platform to preach the gospel. Many of you know, I... I've had the privilege of, of uh, serving our, our, our township. I've had the privilege of being involved with some of the, uh, the civics in, in our own town. Can I tell you what the real goal and cause is there? It's so that I have another opportunity to preach the gospel. Because you know what? There's folks in this town that need to hear the gospel. And praise God, I've had many opportunities to share the gospel. And I would ask you'd pray for me that I'd continue to have more opportunities to share the gospel. The question for you and I is, what will you do with those opportunities, and do you even see them that way? Paul gives his defense here uh, before uh, the people. Perhaps there were some that were convicted and that were good to hear his story, but uh, overall the result was uh, they still wanted, uh, wanted to kill him. Paul spends the night that night in jail. Look, if you would, with me at verse number 30, we, final verse of chapter 22, we did not read it. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Paul is escorted now uh, to the council. Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Very interesting. I don't know if you could ever come to a place in your life where you'd say, you know, I've, up to this day, I, I've, always, I've tried to do God's will going forward. The high priest Ananias commanded them, they stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? It's not common practice for witnesses on the stand to be, you know, punched in the face, all right? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Paul said, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For as it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. When Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, am I called to question. So now Paul brings up a third tactic. Or one, I would say, a third situation is pressed upon him. He speaks out to the priest, and uh, from, the, from the beginning of this trial, let me tell you, do you think it's going to be a fair trial? If the first way... The first interaction you have in trials, as you introduce yourself, they punch you in the face, right? Not going to be a fair trial. Uh, he has no confidence of how this is going to go. As a matter of fact, I believe this is one other indication of the poor eyesight that Paul had. He should have been able to recognize who the high priest was, and he didn't. And even then, when he gets a perception, it says he, he, he perceives, uh, he perceived and on one, uh, one part were Sadducees, the other part were, were Pharisees. This is something, maybe he heard, he heard their whispers, I don't know. He was able to, to somehow know who he was in front of and, and what, um, basically, they had proved that they could not be unbiased. <laughs> uh, real justice is pictured and personified uh, by what? Uh, by a woman holding a scale, right? And she's blindfolded. What is it trying to symbolize is that if real justice is going to take place, it doesn't matter who it is. Let's put, put the actions uh, that have been taken on a scale and let, let the weight of what has happened actually be the decision maker, uh, not uh, some relationship that you have uh, with a person. And proving right away uh, that, that he could, they cannot be unbiased. Let me ask you this question. This kind of puts things on the other side of it. Uh, do you allow your feelings uh, to be clouded by some action or perhaps the previous thing that someone has done. It's kind of what's going on here. The Pharisees were ultra-conservative. It was, if you could kind of break things down by political party, the, the Pharisees, uh, they were the Republicans, all right? And the Sadducees, uh, they were the Democrats. 
Sadducees believed in everything that was, they were humanists. Uh, they believed in the natural world. They believed nothing was beyond this natural world, and, and uh, that was the end of it. Uh, theologically, uh, they were similar to an atheist, right, or agnostic. They didn't really believe. Uh, perhaps there was a God, but, but he did not supersede or intend, and there was, there was nothing beyond this life. The Pharisees, however, we still have them around today. Uh, they, most of the, uh, the people that would trace their theology back to the Pharisees, they, they live in Lakewood, right? And they have the curly sideburns and the big hats, right? You know what I'm talking about? Those are the, the Orthodox Jewish people are, are the remnants of the believers that would call themselves uh, the, uh, the Pharisees. And they do believe in the supernatural. They do believe uh, that there's something kind of on the other side of this life, that we will be judged by God, and that God uh, intercedes in this world in a supernatural way. And so he recognizes there's these two sects, and Paul exploits the division within the council uh, for his own safety that day. He says, this is not going to go well. He, he, he kind of pulls the emergency hatch on things and says, uh, let's get them arguing. And it's a very, um, very covert strategy, if you will. He decides not to make his case in an overt way, he tried to prove his innocence. He said, I'm not going to get a just trial here, so let's call a mistrial. Let's get them fighting between themselves. He says, the real reason, and he brings back, uh, all the way back to the idea of the resurrection. Why uh, was Paul called into question? Because he believed Jesus was the Messiah, and Jesus had risen again. And he knew, you know what? The Pharisees are going to have a problem with that. Why? Because they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And the Sadducees are going to have a problem with that because they don't believe anybody can raise again from the dead because uh, there's nothing after this life. So he said, I'm bringing this up. They're both going to disagree and they're end up fighting with each other. It's exactly what happens. Look at verse number six. It came to pass that as I made my journey, uh, oh, excuse me, verse, chapter 23, verse number six. But when Paul perceived, uh, verse seven, and when he had so said, uh, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against God. When there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him back again, right back into the castle. We'll conclude with this verse. Uh, next week we'll have to talk about the conspiracy to murder Paul, all right? By the way, there's lots of intrigue in Paul's life, right? Especially in this last season. But look, verse number 11 will be the last verse for tonight. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. You ever been in a, a low estate Wondering, Paul, if he's going to live or die. Twice now, every day, he's taken opportunities God has given him to try to give his testimony, to speak of the miracles of the Lord Jesus, to talk of what God had meant to him, and both times ended with him almost being beaten to death. But that night, Paul receives a visitor. It wasn't any ordinary visitor. He wasn't on the docket. He didn't have to come through and get approval. No, God just showed up right there, and he calls Paul by name. And he says, Paul, be of good cheer. You see, Paul, not only did he get to have the confidence of the presence of God, but God let him in on some of his purposes. He says, you're fulfilling my purpose here in Jerusalem. And yes, uh, that prophecy uh, will come. The decision you've made to go forward here will end in your death. But my purposes are going to be fulfilled both here in Jerusalem and, and as you head off eventually for execution in Rome. And something was confirmed that perhaps was something that was questioned the whole time. And was it indeed God's will for Paul to be there in Jerusalem? 
I can only imagine that, that some, of the, some of the folks that heard the prophecy of Agabus, right, uh, there in Miletus as he's on his way to Jerusalem, would have said, hey, Paul, if, if it means you're going to Jerusalem and eventually it's going to lead to your death, then don't do it. Then don't go. And Paul says, but I, I know this is, this is God's will for my life. I'm being guided by God. I'm going forward for him. This was, this was God's calling. I'm, I'm going to be obedient to it. God says very clearly to him, not only have you fulfilled my will, but I'm still at work and there's still more ahead for you. Look, when I look at the, the prophecy of the scriptures, I look for uh, the United States of America. Anyone, anyone know that the United States of America is not actually in the Bible? That, that, right? And I think about, well, exactly where, uh, where do we stand and exactly where are we headed? Uh, can I, I, but I, I don't know. As a, as a nation, I don't know. I've said this before, there's really only two kind of possible outcomes for it. Either the kingdom of the Antichrist, right, conquers the United States of America, and that's how they rise to power globally. Or the United States is the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's really the only two options. Whichever one that it is, God's presence is with us. He's promised that I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And God's purposes are still true. And until the moment, look, Paul was told, hey, this is going to lead to your death. Can I say this? Everything that you do in both in the will of God and out of the will of God is going to lead to your death. This is a temporary existence that we have. But we can go forward in confidence, being obedient to God and say, thank God for those moments when God shows up and he says, be of good cheer. You're heading in the right direction. And you've had opportunity here and Thank you for taking it. And you'll have opportunity going forward to take those opportunities too. And I don't know if it's going to be civic freedom or if it's going to be civic, <laughs> our civics getting trampled on. But, but can I say this tonight? It doesn't matter. Not for the Christian. Work towards both. But it doesn't matter which one it is. Press on with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and take every opportunity. And you'll hear from God the same thing that, that God said to Paul. Be of good cheer. I have purpose for you. And I, God said this, I'm still at work. And can I say something with confidence to you here tonight? God is still at work until the day he calls us home. Let's go forward for him with the gospel. Paul shows us not to, not to relish or revel in causing a stir that wasn't the purpose. Not, not to relish or revel in some experience. Not to get crippled by fear, but to simply press forward with the truth. Let me encourage you tonight. No matter where you stand or what worries you have, press forward with the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and God has this message for you. Be of good cheer. Let's, kinda, let's remember, we can have fun while serving God. And we can have fun. Right? This message was given to Paul while in prison, while the turmoil, right after the beating. He's probably still bleeding and still bruised. God says, go forward. Be of good cheer. Keep pressing on. My presence is with you. My purposes are going forward. I'm not done and praise God, that same message is still ringing true in 2022, right? Let's be guided by him. Let's go forward with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this message. We thank you uh, for the truth of your word. I thank you for the clear instruction you've given us of how you use both situations in Paul's life. I pray, dear God, we don't, we don't know what situation it's going to be for us going forward, but we can go forward having confidence in you. We ask for your help. We thank you for your enduring presence. We thank you that you're still at work, both in us and through us. I pray you would continue to work through Bible Baptist Church, through my own life, the lives of the families represented here. I thank you for the wonderful service this morning, for the, the prayers that were prayed. I pray you'd answer those prayers, Lord, as only you can. We thank you for this time now. I pray your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The invitation hymn is number 456. The title is, I need thee every hour. There's no stipulation on that. What kind of hour was it going to be? An hour of opportunity? An hour of persecution? I think the case can be made tonight. The hour of persecution and the hour of opportunity are the same hour. Every hour we need the Lord. 
Brother Kassam leads. We'll sing all the verses. Would you stand together with me? Number four, five, six. I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I happening with Paul's life and a lot of craziness, but I have news for you, all right? It's not going to get any better. It's actually going to kind of get worse for him. That's how it's going to go. And, and, and sometimes our prayer is, hey, God, uh, give me a little relief, right? Or, and there's nothing wrong with praying that. Jesus in the garden prayed, right, for things to be removed. There's nothing wrong with praying for that. But when God says no, this is the direction it's going to go, right? We all we need to accept the yes and the no as an answer from God. And may I encourage you to kind of pray this way, this way, that God, no matter what the future holds, no matter what the next hour is, help me to, in a more, in a more real and uh, experiential way, recognize that I need you. Because if 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 it's uh, ease or if it's persecution, whatever it is. If, if it brings us closer to the Lord, we recognize our need for Him in those moments, that's, that's, that's spiritual growth. That's what this life is about. That's a beautiful prayer. And let me encourage you. We're going to sing this, this last verse together, but let that be your prayer. Lord, show me, help me to rely upon you to know that whatever the next hour holds, I need you in that hour. And ask the Lord to grow our relationship with Him. Would you sing the last verse? Sing it as a prayer together. We lead us, Brother Kassam. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Wonderful uh, time this has been. I hope that, um, that you got some chocolate today. You know, we had so many people this morning. We ran out of chocolate. Every Sunday, Mother's Day, we get chocolate, and I always get some afterwards. And this, it's like a, what is this called? This is a um, first world problem. I don't know. No, this, <laughs> I didn't get any Mother's Day chocolate today. But you know what? That's, that's kind of a good problem to have. We had so many folks and so many mothers, and man, what, what a blessing. If you didn't get any, let me know, because I think, you know, I, if there was anybody that was like, oh, I'll give it to the visitors. If there's someone, I want to make sure that your diet is spoiled, okay? I want to make sure that we get you 
get you your chocolate. Uh, God bless you for being here tonight. Uh, Brother, Brother Shane uh, Tyson, would you go ahead and close in a word of prayer? Um, give, us, give us an update. Any update on Nicole? So Nicole is Shane's sister, and um, they have the doctors, they found, really, it's a blessing. They found a cancerous tumor. They found it and were able to surgically remove it. And so she has a recovery ahead of her, but that's good news. They believe the surgery was a success. So let's continue to pray uh, for Shane's sister, Nicole, and uh, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Would you lead us, brother?